so I'm going to summarize what we did on the course thus far very quickly, and then I'm going to want to move onward to set up the stage between what we did in this course and what we'll do next semester, uh, which is contemporary literary theory. Um, and what I'm going to do is use three writers that are often important for literary theories of the 20th century, but aren't literary theorists per se, but they are vastly influential in the literary theories of the 20th century, in part because of the groundwork that, was, that has been done by uh, the linguistic theorists of the 18th century. So what I'm going to submit to you is that, and I think I've already stated this pretty clearly, is that the Geisteswissenschaft and in the 19th century they come out the spiritual sciences or the human sciences, which are replace the humanities in the university and gradually start to pull the natural sciences over to them because of course uh, the view of knowledge, which is knowledge is that something doesn't uh, pertain to truth but rather to probability, the methodology of the experimental sciences, sciences starts to bleed over into the natural sciences. So at first the natural sciences can look down on, upon the humanities as being postmodernists and not really holding on to truth or verification or anything like that and uh, end up being a sort of politicized process. But now we see even in our day that uh, even in the natural sciences, we see the, uh, to use the popular term, that the uh, natural sciences are being wokeified, if you will, even mathematics and so forth, the abstract forms of knowing. Uh, <coughs> we're going we're gonna to pivot in that direction and show why that is the case. But it is, as I said to you, because in the 18th century, there's an attempt to understand language uh, from a human vantage point as a natural aspect of human nature, and therefore to come up with a theory of language that will fit that idea of something that we can study objectively, experimentally, and verify the results. And this is a big shift away from what's been assumed uh, up to that point. And because up till that point, uh, whether we have a Christian view of language, which will suggest that language is one of the communicable attributes of God that we share by virtue of being made in the image of God, and we can see that uh, articulated very clearly in Genesis when Adam names the animals and God verifies that whatever Adam named it, that was its name. And I said further that, that when in relation to that particular text that that naming process is a scientific, uh, to, for lack of a better term, it's not just arbitrarily assigning a word to the nature of the thing, it's, it's describing something about the being of the object being named. And with that, we'll have what we will call, or at least in the realm of philosophy, we'll call a correspondence theory of truth, whereby the signs that we use will relate and correspond to the object they represent. And the object that they represent won't, even, won't only refer to the individual object, but a generalized idea of it. So the nature of the object is being described there, in other words, as, as opposed to, a, so a bird, as opposed to a fish. We can call them both animals because they both move, but a bird flies, a fish swims. Okay. And we're not going to confuse those two. They're entirely separate things. They have certain commonalities. We could do a, a taxonomy, which we get in the 18th century as well, the study of taxonomy as a scientific subject and a categorization scientifically from the phenomena that we see, we get this whole taxonomy of uh, biological nature and, and physical nature for that matter. But that's already uh, inherent in the correspondence theory of truth and the way that language is used. Uh, it's there in the, uh, as I say, the, the Greco-Roman world and it's there in Christians. Christians just will uh, give a further addition to it that we will say that it's an attribute of bearing the image of God and it will it comes from that, and we don't, it, uh, human beings did not, as is posited in the 18th century, originate as animals incapable of speech. 
That's not something that developed or evolved over time. That idea of evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary psychology and the evolutionary view of, la of language doesn't antedate the 18th century. It comes from, ironically, the, the study of uh, Boileau's um, publication of Longinus' treatise on the sublime and then this great interest in the sublime. You know, Boileau publishes uh, Longinus' treatise, I think, in 16... 75 or thereabouts, uh, and then the interest in the sublime grows in the, the period and, and things start happening to it, and what happens to it, as I've said, is that um, in Burke and Kant, the sublime and the beautiful are, are differentiated categorically. They're not like one another at all, not so in Longinus. But if we want to account for good and evil, which is what we're going to want to do in language, then we need to have a separate emotional origin for the ideas of good and evil. And we can associate the one with the sublime, that is the evil, and one with the beautiful, namely the good. That will account for that. And again, uh, Edmund Burke's treatise on the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, note the whole title, treatise on the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. It's about our ideas of these things. Where do they originate from? and he associates them with certain feelings. And these feelings are very strongly expressed, more strongly, however, in the, in the case of the sublime, which is because it is, so, is associated with, with terror and with extinction, but above all with power. He emphasizes the importance of power in the different two experiences. So in the sublime, we fe feel powerless. We feel a threat that we cannot defend ourselves against. And he will say that the idea of death is the most powerful feeling that we can experience. It just it paralyzes us with fear. And he says there are certain natural objects that seem to represent that to us, like the grandeur of a mountain like Mont Blanc, which is a sort of a pilgrimage site for the 18th century. They go to the Mont Blanc to experience a natural representation of the sublime. Uh, or you could say a vast ocean, or you can think about a shark beneath the waters in Jaws, where you imagine there's something there, but you can't see it. And it's more terrifying before you see it than when you see it, when it finally comes up. It's, it's, just, it's however awful it has, big sharp teeth. It's not as terrible as you imagine it to be. But the imagination of the idea of that, which comes from our feelings and our fears, is that sort of uh, genesis for the idea of evil, that evil is something that's going to destroy us. And one of the things that the Romantic poets do uh, at great length is represent these ideas of vacancy or nothingness or annihilation, which is the way that evil is historically represented, by the way. Evil is the absence of good, the privation of good. It's but it literally is a nothingness uh, in, in Christian theology historically, or at least Orthodox Christian theology will present uh, good and evil not as equal and opposite forms, but that as evil as the privation of the good and is essentially nothing. <clears throat> but come this period, evil not only becomes more powerful and infinitely more powerful, it is presented as having a reality to it and an essence to it that would never be found in the history of Western thought before this. By the way, I mentioned the sublime uh, relation to powers that we feel powerless, the beautiful we feel powerful. And from that, Burke will conclude that that feeling of power uh, in relation to beauty is what results in a social good, namely procreation. A man falls, fa finds a woman beautiful, and therefore he wants to reproduce with her. And that produces the whole, there's a, it's a social function. Fear has a social function as well, by the way. It keeps you in line when you're terrified. And totalitarian regimes will use terror. Uh, terror from a, uh, and it's most terrifying when there's no face to the terror when you can't see it, but you know that it's there, it's lurking, it doesn't have a physical manifestation. Tolkien uses this very well in The Lord of the Rings. 
Sauron is not manifest, and it's in a way more terrifying. The, 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 the physical manifestation might be the lidless eye wreathed in flame. That might be it, but that's it. Otherwise, you don't see him. If, he, if you saw him like in the first battle, he just looks like a very large, like as presented in the film, he's another man and he's bigger and he, when he swings his, his sword, you know, whole legions fall. Yes, but that's not nearly as terrifying as the lidless eye that controls everything. The all-seeing, all-pervasive, you know, sees through flesh <coughs> representation of evil. Um, but I talk about that in my, my lectures on Tolkien, his presentation of evil as a, as a privation of good a very historical, historically accurate Christian position. But that's not characteristic of the uh, Western world after the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment shifts it so that evil becomes the dominant, powerful, felt response uh, to a certain experience which we have of terror and of death. And it becomes bigger, and so nihilism comes out of this. There's no history of nihilism. Skepticism agree exists. But nihilism as a philosophical phenomenon does not exist until the 20th century, although Nietzsche mentions it in the 19th century, because it's a natural consequence of the idea that the ultimate reality is evil and is going to destroy us. It is sort of a, when I say natural, it's a, it's a rational implication of that. But Augustine has a view of truth that sees truth uh, and this is the traditional views as something that we can know and it is something that we can rationally access because it is something that we discover. It's in the nature of things and we can access it through language. And the reason we can access it through language is because we have rational minds that work through words. Primarily, we communicate through words and when we communicate, we know what we're talking about. And we know when somebody, although peop, some people are very good at lying, we can distinguish a truth from a falsehood through the laws of logic. And that's why we employ the laws of logic, be precisely because we know that words have a certain power and they can deceive. And they can persuade, even though something's false, they can persuade us though. But the fact that words uh, lay hold of our minds and other people's minds and we com can communicate to it, Remember I said language is a communicable attribute of God, unlike his infinity and his um, omnipotence and so forth. We, he doesn't communicate those to us, uh, or at least we don't have those attributes ourselves. We can understand his omnipotence in relation to our lack thereof, but we don't possess it, but, but language we do. And that language allows us to understand God when he reveals himself in his word, and it also allows us to understand one another when we communicate because the word that's in my mouth was first in my mind a word was formed i articulated it in a certain sound which i learned to pronounce because not all languages are easy to pronounce for people who use a different language i first learned to speak that phoneme and then expressed it in conjunction with other phonemes and that constituted signs that would signify a certain idea and it went from my mouth through your ear into your mind and there was no loss of truth in the process. That's, that's the historic view of how language works and it, and it does, what does it do? It represents something. But as I say, it corresponds, it's a correspondence theory of truth. Theories of truth that will follow this will go into different directions. But that's a philosophical issue and I, I can raise that next semester, but I'm not going to get into that here because it'll get me off, tar uh, off track very quickly. But this is roughly speaking a correspondence theory of truth. Um, Aquinas will also talk about this, um, rooting himself in Aristotle. Aristotle in his topics <coughs> will say that a definition is an account that signifies the essence, that signifies the essence of the thing. And we'll say that the philosopher, basically the, the uh, role of the philosopher is to define things. It's this and it's not that. Come up with a true definition. That's what philosophy really does. And, it, um, and so the definitions will come from the reasons of the things themselves and make the whole of our world intelligible and communicable. And on the basis of that communication, 
we can do things with that. But one of the things we can certainly do is communicate it. And we can do it in a way that is not contingent on time or place or perspective, per se. There is a universality to it. And Aristotle assumes, and Christians also assume, that human nature is a common feature of humanity. Everyone who is human who speaks is a human being. They may regard some people as, um, uh, they may dehumanize people and make them slaves, but they don't think that the slaves lose their humanity. They lose it in one sense, they lose their dignity, but they don't lose it in the sense that they become something other than human. They're just treated like that. They don't have any control over themselves. They can't determine their course in life. They have to do things, they're forced by necessity. So in that sense, they're a slave might be a very bad existence, or it might be a good one. You maybe have a very good slave master who treats you very well, makes you a part of his household, and feeds you well and takes care of you. That's, you can read treatises on slavery where you find that uh, philosophers will recommend that slaves be treated very well. They're considered part of the household. But we also know how that idea of somebody who we can dehumanize and regard as property can result in the opposite in, of abuse. Um, but the point is that human nature is, f is, is an attribute of that person that nobody questions. So that person that is a slave, I don't now consider a, an animal, like a cow or a pig or a horse or whatever. They don't lose that human nature, they just lose some of the distinctions of human nature. It's a political decision, but it's not a, an ontological or an epistemological feature. It doesn't help in that way. But come the 18th century, they will have an, a view of human nature that is based on a different notion of humanity, which is the idea of the organism. I talk about this in my own work. I didn't mention much of it here. I think it's actually important. Um, because this is the common feature between human beings and animals and plants for that matter. It's a view of life as an organic ent entity. And an organism, unlike a person, has no beginning and has no end. And it, it, it invites the idea, which becomes very popular, in, it's certainly common in Eastern philosophy, but it's very popular in our day as well, of us being in, in an ecosystem with our environment. We're constantly in interaction with it. We consume food, the food becomes part of us, we, it's part of the circle of life, that idea. But there's no distinction per se between human beings and the rest of the living world. There's no distinction, no legitimate distinction. Uh, certainly none rooted in uh, good and evil. And so the environmental movement begins in the 18th century as well with this idea that we have a solidarity with the, with the rest of the natural order by virtue of the fact that we're just alive. And so we have a, an organic being. And so the whole organic health movement begins with this thought as well. And as I say, the idea of artificial food, uh, artificial ideas, artifice in general, it starts to become disparaged by the, uh, this overwhelming idea of organic uh, good. And it replaces the idea of a person, by the way, as well, as an individual having dignity by virtue of the fact that they bear the image of God. And human beings' uh, nature then, if, it, if words no longer reflect the fact that we bear the image of God, what do words relate to then? Because even in the 18th century, words are seen as the distinctive feature of human nature, right? They all say that, it, that human beings speak and animals don't. We recognize that they'll have to trace it to something else. If it's not the image of God, what is it? And well, it begins with, in every case, as far as I know, uh, that early, the earliest language began in grunts and cries from strong emotional responses. On the one hand of terror, we scream. On the other hand of cooing and ooing and awing. there's a baby. You make cooing noises like a, like a pigeon. 
loving noises, right? But those are strong feelings expressed, the emotions expressed. We still do that with children. We don't actually even need to speak. We make noises, a certain soft noise. With, with, uh, it, with respect to things we're terrified of, we, just, we don't speak, we scream. And it's a very high-pitched scream. Or if we're angry, then it's a, very, it's a deeper resonance trying to intimidate, um, Im sort of imitating a, a male voice rather than a female voice. We don't go high pitch, we go low pitch, but we roar uh, because we associate men with more physical strength and power, so we want to sound very deep and threatening as opposed to high pitch screaming, which isn't very, it can be terrifying, but it's not intimidating in the same sense. So we, we match that register. So at that point, language is in many ways an expression of feeling. It's not an expression, it's not a means of communication in an, a rational sense. It's a means of commu communication in an emotive sense. doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's, they, they will assert it's profoundly correct. But at, at root, language is a felt response that then takes on words through social conventions. Society will determine what words, so people will start saying, hmm, and the other, hmm, hmm, and, and more articulate the, lang the noises, say, okay, we want to distinguish this from that, we'll use it through noises, and then those noises will take on a, an articulate, it becomes an articulate sound, that becomes a word, and socially we, we agree that that sound means that distinctive thing. But it starts with feelings and then moves towards something that's more rational. This will give the account of anthropology that will arise. The early cavemen were irrational, emotive uh, beings that had strong senses of good and evil, yes, but they articulated it through force. And over time, they then used language and communication would arise from that. So the origin of human, human society was through a pre-rational, pre-logical um, world and so the early poetry was oral and it, it was more passionate and heartfelt the earliest poetry and it was as i say not written down when it came to be written down now we've moved from the poetic age to a more philosophical age or actually they don't say philosophical at this point they'll be happy to say theological because theological will entail the ideas of good and evil, which always is associated with evil, with uh, religion. So the poetic naturally is to the theological, but this in turn, and we can see this in terms of Greek poetics, we looked at Plato's critique of Homer <coughs> and Hesiod, but particularly Homer, he has his chief objection is the portrait of the gods and the, the consequent understandings of justice and moral character. The gods are presented as immoral beings. This cannot be, says Plato. He's not the only one who thinks this way. There's a strong criticism uh, in the, of, of the gods in the poet's mouths, and this will give rise to a philosophical age, which more or less reigns from the time of the Greeks onwards. And the Christians just come along and they throw theology on top of the philosophy. But really, that's a backward step, according to the Renaissance. We need to go back to the origins before Christians came along and tried to, oh, theology, let's get theology back in here, and we'll do a capital T, and we'll insert theology in there. But the Renaissance says, no, we don't want to do that. Let's get rid of this and go back to this. In the Enlightenment, it, it is that spirit magnified because now we're in the scientific age because that's what the philosophical age then goes to the scientific and that we're in that age right now. We claim ourselves to be in the scientific age. Oh my goodness, this is totally dropped off. Nobody's gonna care, but I'm looks like I'm on a ship that's about to fall over. <laughs> sinking maybe it is the case um we're in the scientific age now does this sound familiar this is the basic account of, of anthropology 
And because of that, we can claim that to ignore what comes before us, because we're far more developed, our language is more sophisticated, through social agreement, social consensus, we have a better understanding of good and evil. We understand how power in relation to religion is misused. After all, look at Socrates, what happened to him. The good Socrates was murdered, forced to drink the hemlock by the Greeks for what? For blasphemy. Of course, that's what all happens to all philosophers, all those who support the actual truth as opposed to the theologians which are trying to support their power on the basis of what really constitutes a, a group uh, tyranny over others. That's, that's the account that we're given, right? And now that we're in the scientific age, let's not go back to those days when theology was allowed to trump reason. And the Enlightenment presents itself as a period of reason, above all. It's the age of reason, the age of Enlightenment. <laughs> and I've traced many of the characteristics. I'm not going to follow uh, or reproduce that, that, the whole account there. But more or less, the account is of an emancipation from the Dark Ages, which is how the Christian era is called. Those are the Dark Ages. And return to uh, an Enlightenment. And they're happy to go back to this sort of pre-Christian era, where we find that the Greeks are the closest representation of that essential human nature because they're closer to it than the Romans. The Romans just repeat what the Greeks do, but they're more, they're distant from it. Let's get back to the Greeks. They're more philosophical and they're also closer to nature and their poetry is better and their philosophy is better. So why would we bother with the Roman Empire? Now the Roman Empire, of course, in, what, in the West is the the backdrop for, Christ, for Christianity. It gets interwoven with the Roman Empire. So by getting rid of Latin and Roman, the Roman vestiges, we can throw Christianity out with it. It doesn't occur to them that by appealing to the Greeks, you're not going to deal with Eastern Christendom, which is rooted in, in the Greeks. That doesn't even occur to them. But again, this is a Western, uh, Western European movement, by and large, in the, in the Enlightenment. And I even bought the East and the West are totally separated at this point, really, more or less. <laughs> or they've separated themselves as much as anything. But we move into the scientific age, but then come the scientific age, how are we going to represent language then? Because we find th this problem, that language is so connected to words and words with texts and texts with meanings and meanings with interpretations, that even if we go to the Reformation and Luther, he's still going to associate, in fact, most strongly, the truth of the Word of God. It's very strongly a correspondence theory of truth. He's not moving away from that at all. In fact, he's doubling down on it in many ways. But he's just saying the primacy of this is rooted in the fact that God reveals himself in his Word and his words are true because he self-authenticates, he appeals to himself. I cannot lie. So if God says it, it is true, and he, he swears by something that can represent that. Well, there is nothing that can represent that except him, himself, so he swears by himself. It's even there in the, uh, when, when Moses speaks to, um, hears the voice out of the burning bush and asks God who he is, and he says, I am, tell him that I am sent you. He, it's a self-referential appeal. He self-identifies. Only God does this, by the way. Adam cannot identify himself. He can name Eve, which he does. This is not a power play. He describes that she is life. She's the means of life there. So something important is being said about Eve there, whereas Adam is named by God. What does he name him? He names him after the clay, actually, which is very interesting and, and anticipates what's about to happen. He's going to go back to the clay. But it, it's also a it's sort of a hint to Adam, don't get uppity. <laughs> Don't get above yourself here, because you're clay. You're the stuff that you're walking upon, really. Really interesting, huh? Whereas Eve is life. He, he, Adam is so thrilled with Eve that he's, it's, the, it's the exact opposite. He fills her with uh, praise and delights in her. But once we get to the 
scientific era and the view of trying to study language from the vantage point of humanity, divorced from the uh, theological tradition and the idea of truth as a correspondence of signs to things, which goes from Aristotle all the way up to this period, then we have to have a new theory of language. And the theory of language that arises is that language expresses, uh, there's two possibilities, either expresses feelings or it's a reflection on rational processes. But in either case, it's still rooted in feelings, actually. Both, both of them, even, even the scientific, the, the um, human sciences, still think that words ultimately do not represent reality. They are not corresponding to any reality. They are rational ways of, for us to talk about ourselves that we agree upon. It's a social theory of language. And the result of that is a shift, and now I'm going to move to pivot, as it were, to where we're going to go for the rest of the class, which is the idea of where does this idea that language is a social construct lead us? Given what we've, what, what we've said about from Burke that the idea of the sublime is most easily strongly associated with evil and that the good is most strongly associated with the beautiful. And these are totally separate views. And the idea of God is most strongly associated with evil. That's why so many people today, I, I think, instinctively hate God. So it represents power, sure, power, yes, but divorce from love. And so they come back. But isn't God all loving? Yes, but I can't, and I can't reconcile that idea of all power with, with love. Of course you can't, because you think that love in its essence, or that love in its essence is the beautiful, but God in his essence is the sublime. So I can't connect evil with that. Those two things are, they don't correspond at all. So you tell me that God is love, then, and then they get into this feedback loop rooted in 18th century ideas and associations of God with evil. Nietzsche, or Sartre is most strong, strongly representative of this, the nihilist, or the existentialist Sartre, who bleeds into nihilism. If God exists, he, first of all, he hates him, but it, it's either me or him. If he exists, then I can't. He strongly sees this. But it will lead to Schopenhauer. I haven't mentioned him yet. Oh, let me, I forgot to put this on. It will lead to the idea of the uh, the world as will and representation. What is the world of language referring to then? If, the, if it's not referring to things that we can know by the way our words correspond to them, then what is the world? Well, it's a representation of will. That's what it is. Remember the Latin word for will is our Arbitrio, and so it's arbitrary. It's essentially arbitrary. What removes the arbitrariness of that? I'll try and write myself just for a second before I collapse back down. Um, well, now I'm leaning in the other direction. Is the idea that uh, what it seems arbitrary and, and just willful on our parts is socially agreed, so we can come to think that the words all mean this. It means this and we get enough people to agree to that, then of course it has a sort of a fixity and a certitude to it, which it actually lacks in reality, but as long as we agree to it, then the word, that's what the word means. It's not that Adam says that and that's the nature of the thing, it's rather that we all say that this is that and therefore it is so. We socially will it, we socially agree. This is Emile Durkheim's theory of language, by the way. This, the prominent sociologist, father of so modern sociology, Emil Durkheim. It, it's just a social construct. That's what the words are. They're social constructs. And the society can decide that the words have a new meaning. 
I, I just came in this morning hearing the Oxford English Dictionary has new words, the word of the year and so forth. It's, it's adapted itself to an evolutionary view of language here. So that the, the latest word that's one of the words of the year is ris. So I've never even heard. Somebody has ris. Yeah, you laugh because you know it. I've never heard of it. That shows how out of touch I am with the reality. Yeah. From charisma. So you, anyway, okay, whatever. So you laugh. I've never heard of the word. Okay, but it's the word of the year. As I say, it shows how detached from uh, the world and its representation I am right now. Too caught up in my books. Um, but that idea, that word is a new word. And they will say, if it's used socially enough, then we'll include that in our dictionary. And the dictionary reflects the reality that the world now uses. Remember the Oxford English Dictionary uh, is more, of a, more or less an archaeology of language. It traces the earliest instance of a word being used and it puts it down in the book. And so with that, you can come up with an etymology. You can go all the way back to its first use, which is the root of the word. And then you can see how the word develops over the course of time. So it's, it's useful as, a, as an archaeological tool. But the importance of it when it was first founded is we want to get back to the roots of words because the root meanings of words would be the original sense, not the debased misrepresentation of the words. And so this is why a man like Tolkien or Lewis or most of the people in the 19th century wanted to go back to learn old languages because the old languages got the real sense of things. There was a sense of the fall of language. And the words then were meaningful, not emotional grunts and cries. That's a different, that's the, the origins of the Oxford English Dictionary. Now it's moved into an evolutionary phase. And it sees a different spirit to it. Now it expresses society as we want it to be. And the way we want it to be is ultimately the way it is because reality conforms to our desires. Because the world is what we will to represent. That is just what language is. It's an arbitrary representation of the world as we see it. So Schopenhauer begins with Kant and says that the world's only comprehensible with the aid of the constructs of our intellect. And he cites three, space, time, and causality. But he, he uses Kant's ideas and, and applies them. And these only show the world as an appearance. This is how it appears, but it never is. So Schopenhauer, who presents the way in which the world presents itself to us, is, yes, rooting himself in Kant, but again, 18th century theories of language. It's not a correspondence to any truth. It's not a correspondence to anything. The sign actually points to other signs, a group of words that relate to other words, but never actually relate to things. And if we think they're sufficiently important, we might give them uh, the, the, the language of good and evil or being or non-being, or that's God and that's the devil. But that isn't really that thing. It's just how we feel about those things. So your God can be any God you want it to be, and he may look like you want him to look and be like you want, but ultimately the, the thing in itself is unknowable. Kant agrees on this, that in fact it's at the center of his things. This thing on sich is unknowable. Thing in itself. Um, so from that view that what language is, is an expression of social will represented in the terms of a language which never touch the essence of things and therefore they don't communicate truth they communicate desire we get different thinkers and we get three in particular and uh, these are the what uh, Paul Ricoeur who's a contemporary uh, philosopher hermeneuticist actually Ricoeur calls the three masters of suspicion. Because now we see a, a, an emergence of something very new in, in Western thought. It's not just a move away from the idea of the correspondence of, of 
theory of truth where signs refer to things and therefore truth and falsehood are legitimate categories that we can uh, disambiguate through the laws of logic and come to a common mind conclusion because com because words actually do communicate truths to other minds and a shared view of reality which we can trust because God made the world he created the world and he revealed it for us to understand it through our minds the whole Western University is predicated on this we move away from that idea to the idea that language is used for a different purpose it has a social purpose. It's not to represent the truth because it can't represent the truth. It never, ever represents the truth. That's an impossibility. And that we, we can't know those things. So Jordan Peterson, who's rooted in this idea, says that we can't know God. He would love to claim to know God. He thinks that it is intellectually untenable. So he's from the confines of his discipline, which is rooted in the 18th century and in the Geisteswissenschaften, he says in a very good Kantian fashion that that idea of God is unknowable ultimately. And it is important that you believe in this, but actually on a, on a strictly academic level, I can't say to you that I know that God exists because no one can't. That's an, a claim that you don't, you don't realize you can't make that claim. Why does he say that? He does say that to people all the time. He does it without malevolence, but he's saying you, you don't understand, you, you're out of your depth on this, you don't understand that that claim is an impossible claim. It's because, again, he thinks that language is not rooted in a correspondence to reality in that sense. Language doesn't work that way. The whole discipline of psychology that arises out of this view is also in agreement with Peterson on this. So he's been, by his discipline, forced into a position where he wants God to be real and true, but he doesn't think it's possible for it, us to know that it is the case. Very difficult position to be in. Everything in his being leans in one direction, but his, his, his uh, intellectual being has been so formed by the academy and its idea that language is an expression of the will and it just represents that, that he can't get there. But three people will arise from this, chiefly. And I'm going to mention all three and go through them very briefly. First one is this man. The, um, I call them masters of suspicion. Now, there's a difference here between suspicion and doubt, by the way. Descartes in that initiated the the system of doubt, right? And thus skepticism. I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am. So the whole scientific world is predicated on doubt. Test and verify, or trust and verify even. You have to verify for yourself, how do you verify it? through experimentation, use the scientific method. That's how we will make certain. We will make certain with our, with our own two eyes, through observation, what is true and false. Now, unfortunately, this, the uh, scientific method, if it requires the things or the, the physical empirical realities as the uh, verification process can never come to make claims about God because God is an invisible being. But for that matter, we can't even verify from that vantage point, we can't even verify that our minds are real or our souls are real. And many people will dispute them on that basis. They'll again adopt the epistemologically correct view according to their worldview that those sorts of things that are very important historically, we'll acknowledge that, but we ultimately can't know them. We have to be agnostic on those things. Does God exist? Do human beings have a soul? Is there a meaning and purpose in those life? I don't know. I can't know. Um, but Nietzsche will be one of those that will come out of this, not with doubt, but with suspicion. And suspicion is based on the bad motives of others. So it has a different character to it. There's a, there's a negative negativity to it that is a different feature because the language is socially 
produced and socially constructed, it relate, I relate to society differently. And I'm suspicious of the motives for this. So now in this, from here on, the masters of su suspicion, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud, you know what, I'll do them in different order. Let me put up Mr. Marx first. Where's that guy? There he is. Oops. There's that guy, in fact. And Mr. Engels as well. Uh, these men will come up with a social explanation for how language is used. And what is the social explanation? Well, roughly speaking, roughly speaking, if I can get this, um, the main claims of uh, Marx and Engels is that language plays an essential part in the evolving process by which we in social relationships create a historical reality that we all agree upon. Language does this, but it's through a social process. Language is very important. It's important because that becomes our view of history. It, the narrative, the meta narrative of how things evolve becomes the, the way in which we come to agree that something's true or false. And thus far, says Marx, the view of reality is that it has suited the interest of the aristocrats, the so-called aristocrats. But the aristocrats are never as good as they claimed they are. And they actually use language to keep those who are like themselves in society in a abject position. And the purpose of this, <clears throat> because this is one of the books, Communist Manifesto, the other is Das Kapital. Das Kapital re reveals the true motive, and the, the true motive is money. So Marx will say that everything is about money. Nietzsche is going to say it's all about power. And Freud is going to say that it's all about sex. This is the motive for all three. And that is the, the lens through which their suspicion is lodged at the way language represents history. All three of them share a common suspicion. But the, but the ground motive of that is differently attributed. Now you can connect all three, by the way. It's easy to say that it's all three of those. It's money, sex, and power. All three, money, sex, and power explain everything. Let's see if I can find this. I'll just blank this for a second in case it does something weird on me. Where is this? Uh, don't want that. Don't want that. Oh, it didn't even bring it up. How annoying. Go away. I had a nice, just give me two seconds here. But in the case of, of Marx, he, he attributes this exactly to a, uh, an attempt of those who are the aristocrats and later the bourgeoisie who start getting more wealth to hold on to their wealth, to exploit the social system through language, through policing, through laws, to be able to keep more money for themselves and keep it away from others. The idea that, that the resources of the earth are, are fundamentally scarce and that there, and it's a zero sum game more or less. So if I don't get it, they're not, then there's nothing left for me. Not the idea which is opposed by Adam Smith and say, well, that actually, if we're productive and so forth, the, 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 the possibilities is that everybody, all boats can, can rise. But ultimately there's a sense that in both cases that reality is a material thing. 
where is this? It's a material thing. And um, again, this is rooted in the 18th century. Note that Marx, by the way, as a philosopher wrote that his uh, doctoral treatise on Democritus, the uh, Greek atomistic philosopher. And the atomists regarded, um, oh, I can't even do that, it's so annoying. I think of it. All these verification processes drive me insane. Um, this should work. There we go. They're all going to root this in physiological needs. Need, Marx is the, is the ground floor. Our, our real need is of this. Well, we need air. So we need, we need air, we need food, we need water, we need shelter, we need clothing. These are physical needs. So he's a materialist, so naturally he points, this is Maslow, the Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. He's gonna to point to those. That's the ground motive. Ultimately, all human beings, if we wanna speak of humanity, in a scientific fashion. We need to look at the thing that is most essential and we need to address that because that's the ground motive. It, to, and it will fit with the idea of the survival of the fittest then as well. Because the fittest, of course, will have more of those physiological needs covered. And of course, the bourgeoisie and the aristocrats are going to manipulate language such that they can gain those things and they can deprive uh, others of those same things because of course the material world is limited and it's a zero-sum game and so they will keep the working class from that and so he, he introduced the introduces the idea of a class struggle and that the words will seize upon the means of production and that w is the way that justice will be done historically so justice is seen in in conformity with the idea of different groups achieving what is right for them Marx puts himself on the side of the uh, common people and says, this is how we will do it. And it will come about through a violent revolution. But he's a materialist. And as I say, the ground of the suspicion is he thinks that everything's about money, about material wealth, because he's a materialist. Uh, so this is, useful. this is useful based on Schopenhauer, forget about them. Oh, it's because I had to increase the size of that one. Let's go on to Mr. Nietzsche now. So Marx, as I say, points at the money. Nietzsche points at the power. And this is very interesting. Um, another motivation for representing your will and having a social agreement is for the sake of power. Now, Freud or Nietzsche is the first one that is famously connected with this, but we can also see it in a 20th century theorist by the name Michel Foucault, the most cited researcher in uh, Western academia for the past 40 years, Michel Foucault, who was a, a, a gay man who wrote a history, he called it an archaeology of knowledge, in which he again used the motive of power in relation to sexual orientation and so forth. First French public figure that died of AIDS, by the way, 1984. Notoriously uh, abusive. But cited in Western academia, how come? Were they all, you know, was it some gay conspiracy or something like that? Like, were there that many gays in academia that would promote it? I don't think so. I think it fit in with a certain idea of the motivation for, for life being about power. They already agreed with this. Once you agree that the motivation for this and you're suspicious of it, it's all about power, then it's very easy at that point to move in the direction of whose power and for what purpose. But let me not go ahead to uh, Mr. Foucault, we'll come to him next semester, uh, and talk more about uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche, in 
the genealogy of morals will suggest that uh, we are involved in creating ideas of, a, of guilt and conscience, good and bad. And he says that these ideas of personal responsibility and guilt come from emotions, notions of, of credit and debt and compensation and calculation. But the idea of being in somebody's debt and feeling guilt will be fit into our so notions of, of morality then. In uh, the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our trespasses, but in certain renderings, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. If we're indebted to somebody, we feel obliged to them, and there's a moral obligation there, which we're acknowledging that. But is it actually a moral obligation rooted in reality, or is it just simply a something that's constructed by society? So Nietzsche also suggests that human conform, uh, communities form initially on the basis of security, these sorts of hierarchy of human needs, safety, security, step up from Marx, love and belonging, self-esteem, all these things arise from it. Well, Nietzsche is the next step up in his uh, explanation of, of where these things. So they come up with the same mechanism of deb debit and credit. A person gets protection and peace and comfort from living in a community and they pledge to behave in a certain way to that community in return. And if they don't, the community will collect the debt in another way. They'll put you in debtor's prison because you've broken your promise to the community. And as the community uh, be grows more powerful, the deviant actions of one individual are less threatening to the community's existence. But early on, if one person who is a trusted individual has that sort of uh, responsibility of debt to the community and he doesn't re isn't faithful to his debt, indebtedness, then the community itself is going to be destroyed. But as human, human societies evolve and get bigger and bigger, um, it shifts the motivation or the punishment for this. Instead of inflicting pain on that person or exiling them or killing them, which we see in the case of Socrates, the community just isolates the criminal, puts them in prison, shuns them, isolates them. But when the community becomes threatened or weakened, harsher punishments come back again. And if there's a perception that, the, the, that there's not just one individual, individual, but a whole host of individuals that are doing this, then society will use its language to again start to police language to bring in harsher sanctions. And the modern penitentiary system will rise out of this. And eventually he will say that uh, people will come alongside and, and religions will say that this is because of notions of good and evil related to God. And he'll say that this is just a made up. Um, as, as the human community gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the social conventions get richer and richer and richer, he thinks that, that um, religions start to want to um, give clarity where before there's actually less clarity and say to hold on to the idea of good and evil, they say that these are absolutized from our notions of moral nature. And we, we project those upon this being called God whom we can't know and we say exists. But it's the appeal of power. And the, for Nietzsche, the hero, the Ubermensch, is one who has a will to power. And the will to power will put him outside and above the group. He'll be a hero, in a sense. He'll be a Promethean figure. We've seen this in romantic literature. Nietzsche is very much uh, in sync with the, uh, the spirit of, of, of Shelley and, uh, and Byron. And even Keats to some degree, very much uh, in, in, in sync with that idea of, of an individual who, whose grandeur, a greatness, sense of purpose 
elevates himself above the group, the group who has become corrupted, and we will effectively be, be pulled up by his efforts, a great hero figure. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, by the way, recommends atheism because atheism breaks the idea of being indebted to other people. It's part of the will's power. Don't feel guilty. Because if you, if you do feel guilty, eventually you're going to turn that upon yourselves and you're going to think that you're evil and you'll never be able to repay God. And so you will be afflict yourself with suffering. You become a masochist. Or you'll blame other people. You'll be a sadist. You'll inflict that on other people who you think have weakened you in some ways. And you'll take it out on them. The idea that God atones for our sin and pronounces us free, Nietzsche thinks is ridiculous. Although he, he himself traces the effect of guilt in uh, people's psychological actions. So in this sense, he's the figure that lies between Marx. Remember Marx, who's dealing with the lowest realm of the physiological needs. He moves in the direction of here, Nietzsche, power related to safety, security, but even love and belonging, because of course at that, that point, and even all the others for that matter, these are more extended. So these are less material, they're more spiritual needs. And now we'll introduce our third thinker, this man, Freud. That's a hill, don't you think? In the foreground, that's a hill, right? What do you see, you pervert? Well, according to, <laughs> according to Freud, what? You see something there? Um, according to Freud, language uh, delimits um, conscious from unconscious process. Now the unconscious processes are our, our feelings, but our feelings can be arising in a way that is not rational. Or it's even pre-conscious. Note that how this again fits with the idea of poetry being related to feeling before we even come to reason about the phil philosophical way uh, and rational and logical way. At root, it's a felt thing that we may not even be aware of. So ironically, he, he will say that this is even pre-physiological. It's down even below this. It's below the surface. And the way that Freud's theory is often presented is it's like an iceberg. It, well, it's the, it's the like 90% is allegedly beneath the water. Well, that's what the subconscious is doing. It's, it's really the ground motivation for what you really drives people. All these things, including self-actualization, that is everything's related to something that's below this and namely that sex. So rather than appealing to something that's above us, God, ideas of goodness and beauty and truth in relation to God, how God reveals those things to us in his son, uh, we will attribute, we will find in them the motivation is something that's below our nature. It's, it's, it's underneath. And chiefly he will associate this with sex. Because yes, that's not just a mountain there that you see. And he will have a theory of art in relation to this. He'll have a theory of, uh, Freud's famous for his Oedipus complex and Electra complex, which again, he will associate to some degree, he's read Nietzsche with certain motivations of guilt attributed with certain desires. This is illicit, this is licit. Um, this is moral, this is immoral. Those are all socially assigned and for both men, for all, every one of this variety, all of those ideas of morality and immorality are socially constructed and effectively are arbitrary. Because at the end of the day, everything is a will and representation. So even such things as, we'll take the case of Oedipus, uh, incest, that idea and association of it being grossly immoral and somehow 
Even the gods are angry about it and want it to be destroyed, even though they themselves are incestuous. Um, that is clearly just a social construction and arbitrary and not related to anything we need to hold on to. And in fact, socially, if we want to make progress as a society, we need to be suspicious of the idea of morality connected with certain actions and uh, against other actions. You can see where uh, Foucault is going to connect with Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. And again, the 20th century literary theorists, so-called postmodernists, are all rooted in the hermeneutics of suspicion, and they just connect all three of them. They're happy to unite the three. Because after all, the hierarchy is one being, and, and Freud just says there's something below this that's motivated that we can't see. Well, he has to, because unless you're a materialist, you have to attribute something outside of this. And some people can attribute to language, but again, what does language represent? It represents something that we can't know. Well, the something that we can't know is the motive for our wills, and the motive for our will has to be one of these three things. Everybody's in agreement on that. So at Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, uh, note that as it goes upwards, it becomes less and less physical and more and more spiritual. It becomes more like morality and creativity and spontaneity and acceptance and meaning and purpose, the Viktor Frankl meaning. It arises once these, but it's a higher aim. A Christian view was that actually meaning is connected to all of these things. It's shot throughout because meaning is connected to God's purposes, and God's purposes are to provide for our physical needs as well as all of our spiritual needs because it doesn't divorce the two. They shot throughout every physical activity is also a spiritual activity. <clears throat> but that's more or less where it will go. Come the 20th century, we'll have a different view of language then. I'll begin next semester by talking about different theories of language that will come uh, to try and support this in a linguistic fashion, this view of language, but it will come up alongside these already pre-existing views of, again, uh, Marx and Nietzsche and Freud. And, those and they will unite together. And so going back to what we said at the outset about theories of good theories of literature, which will account for the, the four causes, the original cause, you know, the, the, the writer's intention, if you will, the, the formal causes of the, like the poem and the instrumental causes of what happens within it, or the instrumental and the formal rather. So the instrument is, let's say, a uh, drama, a work of drama, and the um, the formal causes are using different actors and different uh, writing it all in one day within 24 hours, uh, certain features, specifics of that. Towards the final cause, which is the audience, these are going to start to construct world views. This, we, so this is why these become powerful. They start to assign a, a purpose to the original thing and also a, a motive for the text as well. It will spiritualize it, and this is why they become particularly powerful and difficult to controvert. Because they're all explanatory. Everything is motivated by money, sex, and power. If you talk to people today, almost everybody will say that everything is motivated by those three things. Every motive. Now, they have great deal of difficulty, all of them, with things like charity with Christian, the idea of doing things for or loving your enemies, the agape love. They have, they have enormous difficulty. In fact, they can't deal with the atonement. The atonement breaks all of these things. And in fact, Christians like myself came to faith in part because the idea of the atonement absolutely destroys the motivations ascribed by these three men. As I say, I just see, I, I actually see Foucault as a subset of all three of these, by the way. He's just building on them. Um, 
So once again, are you going to see language then as a power play or some sort of a social construct construction for the purposes of somebody else other than you? Or are you going to see language as a communicative process, which is the means of true community? I mean, those are part of the choices. But the other one is, is the university, is the field of learning actually connected with truth anymore? And I think the Christian view, which is the pre-18th century view, is the only show in town. And uh, that's why I came, decided to leave the public academic world and enter a Christian university, because I think the Christian world is the way forward on this. But we, we need to stop using the 18th century views of language and its whole motivational structure uh, for our own actions. This is appealing to concepts that are alien to the Christian faith because we're not baited on, based on the dubito or the suspicion. We're based on love and trust and belief. There's are very different motivations. And the motivations are very important here. And also the idea that good is far greater than evil. In fact, evil is like a shadow cast by the good and which we can see when the light casts itself on an object. We see it's just that's all it is. But no doubt in these days, these views seem to be very powerful, all powerful. Well, that's because, again, we've been regarding them as true, even though they themselves say that there is no truth. So why regard them? To have that legitimacy they themselves don't claim it is other than in each case they say there's no such thing as truth except the material way of looking at reality is the truth or the motive of power is the truth we have no access to the truth but this is the true way of looking at things or, and we we have no access to the truth but sexual motive m motivates everything they, they claim that's a true view that, so they contradict themselves and they have to because only when it's a truth claim does it have any legitimacy and purchase on people's minds. So we need to be more epistemologically self-conscious ourselves about what we believe and why we believe it and how it relates to these other views. But we'll deal with that next semester and we'll, we'll try and uh, bring some of the stuff we learned this semester into that and hopefully it will equip us to go uh, engage with the world going forward. Okay.